Once you've done that, I want to say that this morning's lesson is again a requested topic. Today we're going to be talking about young people and the church. And the question has been asked, what is the role of young people in the church? The Bible has a great deal to say about the role of, of older people in the church uh, as far as our jobs. What does the Bible address to our young people? Since we have several young people here, I thought it was a, a good idea that this be brought up, this be talked about, because the young people are important body of believers. I think in order to understand that, we need to understand the purpose of the church. Before we can actually understand anyone's role, young or old, uh, we need to understand the purpose that God created the church for. The church obviously not being the building that we're assembled in, but the body of believers located at this place. What is our purpose? What We might wonder, what is our mission statement? What Why, why do we exist? And every church should exist for the same biblical reason. And that reason that God established the church is relatively the same whether you're old or young. Let's look at this. The first thing the Bible teaches us is that the reason for the church's existence is for evangelism. The saving of souls. Jesus left us what we call the Great Commission. I want to go to uh, Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 28 first. I've got these in reverse order. But let's go to Matthew chapter 28 first. And begin with me in verse 16 instead of verse 19. I'll read for you this entire paragraph. And depending on your translation, you may even have a heading here of the Great Commission. That's not in the original text, but that's added uh, like the verses. But this paragraph is headed the Great Commission in my Bible. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority, is, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And some of your translations will end that with amen. And so in this, Jesus is giving the disciples a job and a task, a mission, you might say, that they were to accomplish. They were to go into all the world, the same as we are. The reason we exist on 2nd Street today is part of that going into all the world. We go into the world, we teach others about Jesus, we teach them about the gospel. And then it goes on, not just teaching them, he says, then teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's really a second phase of that. Now, if you will go to Mark's, the ending of Mark's gospel, parallel passage, Mark chapter 16, and um, we'll again uh, look at verse 15 instead of uh, and 16 here. It says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So again, just a parallel passage emphasizing the necessity of evangelism. Being out there, being proactive in teaching others about Jesus. The second reason, there are, I, I, I've condensed it to three main reasons that the church exists. The second reason is edification. And edification is a, a word we don't use a real often, but it means to build up, to encourage, to provide a spiritual family, a place, 
and an environment in which we can grow as Christians. If you would, go back in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians in chapter 4 and verse 11, Paul has this to say about this task or purpose of the church. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers. These are all working components of the first century church. Apostles obviously walked with God. They were ones, the eleven referred to back in Matthew's gospel, were apostles. Evangelists were like the apostle Paul, who went out and preached the word to every creature. Philip is named in the book of Acts as an evangelist. Shepherds are also referred to in other places as elders, who oversee the local body of believers as older men, more mature than others. And lastly, he says, teachers. This may perhaps be the highest category of all listed here. He says the purpose of all of these is the same. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. To build up the body of Christ. Now again, that is directly, in some translations may use, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. To mature manhood. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cutting craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way to him who is the head unto Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So that is an entire section on edification. The building up, the spiritual growth. The church provides the environment in which that takes place. Thirdly, and lastly, a place to worship. A body of believers Jesus says in Matthew's gospel, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And while we're here in the book of Ephesians, let's go to chapter 1. And in verse 12, the apostle Paul says this, So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Paul says that we exist to praise God, to glorify God. And in Peter's first letter in chapter 2, of 1 Peter chapter 2, and in verse 9, Peter also has a comment to be made about worship. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, Peter says this about the Christians, but you are a chosen race. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim, you know, part, of, part of our worship is proclaiming God in his wonder. So Peter says that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from passions of the flesh, which war against your souls. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God 
on the day of visitation. So those are the threefold task of the church, if you will, it, to evangelize, to save souls, to edify or build up the body of believers, and to worship and bring praise to God. One of these is not more important than another. Neither is one less important than the other two. But rather, we have to keep all three of these balanced and in place. We have to put an equal emphasis on all three of these in order to maintain a healthy church. We can look at churches around and we could see, we could nitpick, we could provide evidence. But I want to I give you an example. A church that focuses only on the edification of its members, only on the building up of those who are present, that church will likely neglect evangelization and become ingrown, stagnant, and I dare say, eventually die. Okay? On the other hand, a church that focuses only on evangelization will never mature. A church whose focuses only on evangelization and not on the other two aspects is going to be a very weak and unstable congregation because we are never going to mature in Christ. So we have to struggle. It's a constant balance to keep all three of these in focus. If I dare say that the church in America has failed in any aspect of keeping these three balanced, I would say that we have failed in that our focus has not been an outward focus. For generations, people simply expected people to come to church. And for generations, we have neglected evangelism. And so we see a decline in those attending church. We also, I think, have perhaps neglected edification and solely focused on worship, if you will. Nevertheless, those are aspects that need not be neglected. So how do young people fit? Young people can at the very least, to some extent, kids, take part in evangelism, edification, and in worship. It's important to remember you play as important a role as anyone else. Young people are often neglected. Young people are often not considered. Their, their likes, their dislikes are often dismissed, and that is to our shame. But kids, it's important for you to remember this. God gave you a period of time in your life where your bodies are growing. Not only are your bodies growing, but during this period, and some of you at very rapid rates, my lambs, I'm telling you, uh, they, they, they've just, they just exploded. But nevertheless, your bodies are growing and so are your minds. <clears throat> You're developing into the people that you will be. You're not there yet. It's very important, though, that you remember that God created this time in your life for you to grow and to mature. Now, Esther's celebrating a birthday today, and I believe she's seven years old today. Is that right, Esther? And so she's at a point in her life where she's, She's learning how to read and learning how to write, and she's doing all of this learning stuff. And it's important this time in her life that she learn about God. I'm going to go back to the book of Proverbs for just a moment and, and see what Solomon has to say in the book of Proverbs, chapter 22, and in verse 6. 
Solomon writes about children and their learning period and the importance of that. Solomon says, train up a child in the way he should go. Okay? But he doesn't stop there. The bottom part of that, par that uh, proverb says, even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So you see, kids, it's important that you learn what God expects of you now. You're in a training period. Now, every athlete goes through a training period. I'm not a big sports fanatic, but I do understand a physical training period. It's a time in which you, be, you focus on what you want to do. During your lives, as you grow older, some of you have already considered what you want to do for a livelihood. I think Ruth is interested in massage therapy. And so she is going to spend a great deal of the next few years of her life training for massage therapy. And so it will be with others. You know, Katie's not here this morning, but Katie is spending her life training in college for her career in life. She's studying physics. And so, you know, that's way over top of my element. I, I don't know anything about that stuff. But she seems to love it and enjoy it. And so we see her on Wednesday nights and and she she comes regularly, but she's she's focusing on the next phase of her life. So God gave you this time to learn. And as you learn, this will be what sustains you for the rest of your life. Now, you have to learn about God. It's important you learn about God in order to tell others about God or even to worship God or maybe to build each other up. Learning process. We can't, we can't teach somebody something we don't know. Boy, that's an interesting thing if you've ever watched someone try to do that. Now, I, I had someone um, try to teach me a class one time in, in, in school. Not, not in church, but they tried to teach me a class and they really didn't understand it. You know, my mother failed miserably. I love my mother. But, you know, she tried to teach me music. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't get it. My, because... Not, not because I didn't have the ability to learn it, but because my mother didn't understand music. And so we, we, kind of, we kind of have failed. I'm so thankful that my children are learning music from a much better teacher than I had. I want to go back to the book of Isaiah for a moment. And thinking about this learning period of your lives. We go back to the book of Isaiah for a moment and look at Isaiah chapter 54 and in verse 13 of Isaiah 54, Isaiah says this to the children of Israel. All your children shall be taught by the Lord. Okay? That's the goal of every parent, every Christian parent, is that our children will be taught not only by the Lord, but in the Lord. And great shall be the peace of your children. If God teaches you, if God leads you, if God guides you through your lives, you will have peace. Maybe not a physical peace, but an internal peace. A peace within your soul. Now, it's also important that as you learn, you become as active as possible. Now, this depends a little bit on your age your maturity level, and, of course, your gender. Because we know that God created, God created men and women different, very physically different, but he also created us emotionally different, and he created different parts for us in the church. So it's important, Sarah, that as you grow, you learn what you're capable of doing. Okay? And it's important, that's the reason why we have the boys take active parts, where the Bible allows them, as young Christians, to take active parts 
we try to encourage that with both boys and girls to be as active for the Lord as, as, as doing things. Now, you're never going to learn. See, here's where we fail. I never learned to play the piano because all I had to do was read books. There's no way that we can learn to be a skilled woodworker by reading about it. Doing is part of learning, okay? It's one of the reasons that, that we try to stretch Dennis in different directions. You know, leading prayers, reading from the Bible, these are things in which we learn. And the children learn, the young people learn as well. I never learned so much as when I started teaching my first Bible class. Oh, I've done sermon class for years. Sermons are easy. You don't have a give and take in sermon. In Bible class, oh no, different story. You have people ask questions. You may not have the answer. You have people who have opinions that may differ from yours. So one of the things, and this, this was the biggest thing for me as a young man, was learning to teach Bible class. Because I had to learn to answer questions I might not have thought of. I had to learn to defend my position. If I made a statement, if I said the sky is blue, somebody would go outside and say, I think it's a little gray. And so you have to learn to defend those positions. The Apostle Peter says, be ready always at every time to give an answer of the hope that lies within you with meekness and fear. But doing is part of learning. All too often, the mistake that we make as parents is to hold our children back trying to, quote, protect them. Okay? We want to shield our children just as guilty as anybody else. Maybe not in the church. Kate's looking at me like, uh-huh, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay? So there are things in life, not necessarily in church, but there are things in life that I don't want my children doing because they make me uncomfortable. And all too often, parents carry this with them into the church. Well, I don't want my child up there. What if, what if my child is leading a song and he doesn't sing it right? Who cares? Okay? It's part of the learning process. If we're concerned about that, we need to take an active role in helping our children to make sure that they make as few mistakes as possible. But all too often we hold our children back simply because we don't want to be embarrassed. Not that the children are embarrassed, but we as parents don't want to be embarrassed. I've seen it happen. I've also seen and experienced, now we don't have these here, but Oftentimes, congregations will have men's business meetings. If there's not an eldership there, then oftentimes the, the mode of operation is there'll be a business meeting. Now, the men have a responsibility to do certain things in larger congregations, and there are decisions that have to be made. And so it is encouraged that every man take part in those business meetings. Here's what I've noticed in, in congregations like that where I've preached before. Is that men might have sons who are young, who have been baptized. They don't bring them to those business meetings. Because they're trying to shield or protect them from what could be controversial meetings. Sarah, please. So, I believe that that's a wrong approach. 
The Bible does not give us an age difference. Once we reach an age of accountability and we've become a child of God, we've been buried with him in baptism and we've come to know Jesus, then we need to take an active part where it's available. The Bible doesn't give us you have to be 21 years old to wait on the Lord's table. The Bible doesn't say you have to be 40 years old before you do a sermon. Look with me at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18. Jesus places emphasis on children. In my personal view, going back to children in business meetings, my personal observation is when children are present, adults behave more like adults and less like children. And so I think from that perspective, it might be good just to have children in business meetings just because adults might be able to maintain control of their own emotions. Matthew chapter 18 and in verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like a child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now in this area, a little bit to the west of Marietta, we have millstone quarries. Most of them are long abandoned. But we used to get giant millstones, six, eight, 10, 12 feet in diameter, a tiny hole in the middle. And you can imagine the visual that Jesus wants you to see. You cause a little, a person, maybe not a child, but one who has a child mentality. Childlike qualities. Whoever humbles himself like this little child will be great in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever causes one to sin, to fall, should be drowned in the depths of a sea with a giant millstone hung around his neck, weighing him down. No hope. Comes into the surface. Kids, I have a case in point. Who knows who Josiah is? Anybody know who Josiah is? All right, Ruth knows who Josiah is. Josiah is a king. He's one of the youngest kings on record in history. Now, I don't have time to go back and go into all of the things in Josiah. But I do want to go back to 2 Kings chapter 22, and I want to hit some highlights of this young man's life. Josiah became king at the age of eight years old. Now, ironically, his father and grandfather were evil men. They were men who had forsaken God. They caused Judah, this is the divided kingdom, when Israel was divided, they caused Judah to sin. And along comes Josiah. His father died an early death because of sin. And the Bible says in 2 Kings 22 and verse 1, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkaf, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. I want you to notice that for a moment. Because clear back to David, a man after God's own heart, it says that Josiah didn't go, he didn't deviate from the way God wanted. 
He didn't go to the left. He didn't go to the right. He stayed on course. But if that's all the Bible ever told us about Josiah, that would be great praise for a young man. But it's not. We also have other praise. You know, in Josiah's time, the following paragraph, verses 3 through 7, Josiah really did not understand God. He didn't know God. Remember, his father and grandfather were evil men. Here in, in the first paragraph, he mentions his mother's name was Jedediah, the daughter of Adiah. Now, I think it's interesting that they mention his mother's name because his mother must have had some influence in his life. But I want you to notice what Josiah did at the age of 18. In the 18th year of King Josiah, okay, this is, okay, so that's, it's the 18th year of his reign. Sorry, I probably misrepresented that. The king sent Shaphan, the son of Isaiah, son of Musaliah, Muslim, the secretary. Some of your translations will say Shaphan's a scribe. To the house of the Lord saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may count the money that has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the threshold have collected from the people. And let it be given to the hand of the workmen who have the oversight over the house of the Lord. And let, the, let them give it to the workmen who are in the house of the Lord, repairing the house, that is to the carpenters and to the builders and to the masons and let them use it for buying timber and coring stone repairing the house but no accounting shall be asked from them for the money is delivered into their hand for they deal honestly and what i want you to notice in this paragraph is that josiah while he didn't seem to have a firm grasp on what god wanted yet demonstrates that his heart had a desire to serve God. And he began by repairing God's house, the temple. And then God's law is discovered. I want you to notice this. In the, in the process, God's law, the Bible, had been lost. It had been placed in a cubby hole. Now, we might, if it were here, we'd probably take it upstairs into the attic and tuck it away on one of the bookshelves or in a box someplace, and they're repairing it. They're repairing the temple, and suddenly they find the Bible. They find the scroll. Now, nobody's read this for years. I find it interesting that they're existing. There's a high priest. There are people in place. They're going through motions of worship, but not reading the Bible. They're not reading the law. And this is the law of Moses. It's the law that they're to live by. No wonder things are in bad shape in Judah. No wonder the country's fallen into decay. Now, I want you to notice what this young man does. This young king, read with me verse 8 through 13. And Helkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Helkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan, the secretary, came to the king and reported to the king, Your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight over the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan, the secretary, told the king, Halkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. When the king heard the words, notice, notice Josiah's response. This is not just a, a story that he's reading and, and the king is just not really listening but going about his life. No. The king is listening. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Helkiah the priest and um, Akadam, the son of Shaphan, 
And the Akbor, the son, and Akbor, the son of Malchiah, and Shaphan the secretary, and Asiah, the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of the book that has been found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do all that is written concerning us. Wow! Now there's a young guy with some courage. He hears something from God's word. He makes some application to life. This young man changed the course of history. This young man changed a nation. I have a closing verse. There's so much more to, to Josiah's story than what we have time to get to today. But I do want to go over to chapter 23 and read a closing verse in verse 25 to close out this morning's lesson. This is what is said about him after his death. Or not even after his death, but I'm, I'm sure the book of Kings was written after his death. But notice what is said about him. Before him there was no king like him. who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might. According to all the law of Moses. Nor did any like him arise after him. I want you to think about that. There is, there's retribution that comes after Josiah's death for some things that Judah had done that the nation itself did not repent of. But God had promised Josiah that peace and prosperity would reign in his time because he obeyed the voice of the Lord. Our young people, our young people will change history. They will set the course on which the nation and which this congregation will go. A course that you and I as old people will never achieve. But our young people will. The future is in their hands. It's their determination. Whether they are successful, whether God is successful in this, in this present time. A lot hinges on our young people. And I want to encourage you today. Make sure. Make sure that God is the focus of your life. You can do a lot of things. Just keep God centered. You can go in a circle. Like a string around a post in a yard. You can go in a circle. Around that post. Keep God that circle. The center of your life. Just as King Josiah. If you're here this morning. We can help you in any way. I would encourage you to let us know. As together we stand. And as we sing the invitation.